So what I adopted in 1990 was $1,000 to any customer, publication, or farmer who can out organic me. Hey, this is Dave. Welcome to Regenerative Journey. So for this episode, I came to a farm in Thermal California called Flying Disc Ranch. The reason I chose this farm is because, well, number one, I love dates. And if you've never had dates, you have to try them. That's, that's one reason, it's not really the main reason. The main reason I chose this is because this place stands out in, in stark contrast to the farms all around it. So behind me you see all of this lush greenery. Beautiful, right? So green, ground cover all year round, great canopy up above. Look at what it looks like across the street. So Flying Disc Ranch, I think, meets the qualification of a regenerative farm. Uh, they have cover crops, they have crop diversity, they leave roots in the ground throughout the year, everything on the farm is composted, and there are no synthetic inputs of any kind, no fertilizers or anything like that. Uh, pretty amazing place. So we're going to talk to the owner, Robert. I hope you enjoy this episode, and have fun. Well, I mean, you can imagine we're, we're, we do everything against the odds. We don't get involved in any of the certification stuff, which for a while bothered our local Department of Agriculture because they, they made it law. You couldn't use the word organic unless you were registered organic with them and you kept up their paperwork. So there's a reason why they look the other way with us. And the reason why they do is because we're so over the top of genuine organic that they just quit wasting their time coming out here to inspect stuff. So one of the things I noticed about your property that really interested me is just the diversity and the mixture of these different trees and, and plants all together. I mean this is not what you think of when you... No. This is I not know. what you see around here for farms. No. Well, I'm, I, I'll admit it right off the bat. I'm not a farmer. You're not a farmer? No, what? I'm a gardener. You're a gardener. I'm just a, gardener. a larger scale why do you take this gardener approach versus a farmer approach? My main reason is uh, I've always been a direct marketer. Okay. Because, I mean, how, how better can you judge what you're doing than to uh, see the people that eat it, you know, and they tell you what you're doing. But obviously you're making your living off of this. You sure. have employees. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the cash crop, if you're going to put that label on it, is obviously the dates. So what I end up with when I harvest, I have 20% bigger than my neighbor's fruit. That's normal because it has another month to grow and it never dries out, it never stresses. It's always got moisture at its feet and they assimilate water better. All those things add up to more time on the tree. More time on the tree. Sweeter, bigger, better quality. Part of, the, part of the idea of this farm is to rewild the property. In other words, we came in and we tore everything up. And then once we got water, we started out putting together what we wanted the farm to be. And then trying to make it as hospitable to wildlife as possible. I mean, almost everything that we have a lot of are the good things to have things that uh, predators that eat insects and bugs and all that type of stuff. This is one of the only farms that has a very healthy worm population. 
since 1985, no cultivation, then all this dirt underneath you, it doesn't see this, you know, the burning sun that kills micronutrients. It never really completely dries out. We have the same temperature as our neighbors. The difference is that we have all this green under here that sucks up all that sunlight. Nothing gets reflected. So if you had sunlight reflecting plus the wind and you turn the soil up, you're constantly dehydrating your soil. You're exposing all the micronutrients to the sun, which kills them in most cases. So you weaken your soil. Every time you break it open, you weaken it. And across the street there, the way they get away with farming that year after year, year is, that is that is hydroponics in soil. They'll disc it all up, then they'll come through and plow it, bottom plow it, and then they'll come around with their herbicides, they'll hit all the edges. And then if they plant a, a summer or spring crop, they'll come in and furrow it all up. And, then it'll be aerial bombardment from then on with pesticides or whatever they're doing. Oh, it affects me a lot. Uh, we're not on talking terms with one of the managers. Every other year it goes to a different uh, agribusiness company. And the local one, we don't, we don't communicate at all. But I, I occasionally physically go out there and stop uh, cultivation where the dust is blasting me. I happen to be visiting uh, Flying Disc Ranch on the day that the neighbor is plowing, so we get a sense for the stark contrast again between this place and the neighbor. If you look closely, you can see the dust blowing in the air right behind the plow as it plows. That's topsoil blowing away. That's what I mean when we talk about topsoil loss, literally blown away because it's left bare and it's plowed. My elevation is growing and I'm getting all the all the blow dust catches on this grass. Just the amount of organic material that flies by in a windstorm is making my place better. You're stealing everyone's fertility. Yeah. Yeah, topsoil is blowing my way. Lots of it. Oh, hey. Um, just enjoying a date here from Flying Disc Ranch. Really delicious. Mm, just give me a second. Give me a second. Mm. That's so good. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this episode of Regenerative Journey and learning about Flying Desk Ranch. I know I had a great time there and hearing their great story and seeing the awesome work that they're doing. It's a great example of regenerative agriculture. So if you like this episode, please hit the like button down below. If you want to see more like it, please subscribe to my channel and let me hear from you in the comments. I love to hear your thoughts on what you liked, what you didn't like, and maybe what you'd like to see in the future. So please tune in again. And if you want to hear some great date jokes, hang around for a few more seconds. Thanks. And there are a lot of good date jokes, as you probably know. Yeah. <laughs> I never tire of, so. Do you have any good ones you want to share? Right now? Um, you have to go to California for the hot dates. That's a, that's a classic. Um, dates, you want them in the bag or on the calendar. Robert has a terrible one. He says you have to get the date before you get the fig. That's awful. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> um,